Hello, and welcome to our presentation titled Domestic Abuse and Its Impact in the Workplace. My name is Tracy Darling DeMarcus, and I'm the Prevention Program Manager here at the WCA. The WCA is a local nonprofit organization whose mission is providing safety, healing, and freedom from domestic abuse and sexual assault. We do this in a number of ways by providing much needed services to members of our community. Our larger vision as an organization is to foster a community where individuals thrive in safe, healthy relationships. It is our belief that each one of us plays a part in making this vision a reality for our community and why we're so grateful that you have chosen to spend some time with us today. What do we know? Why does an organization like the WCA exist? Nationally, one in three women and one in four men in the U.S. have experienced rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. And nearly half of both men and women in the U.S. have experienced psychological aggression, in other words, some sort of mental or emotional abuse, by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Sometimes we can fall into a trap of thinking, well, this doesn't happen here in my community, or it doesn't happen here as much as it does elsewhere, but in 2019, there were over 5,200 911 calls related to domestic abuse, sexual assault, or child abuse just in Ada County. So that does not include the larger Treasure Valley area. That runs out to about 15 calls a day. We also know that these things are statistically underreported. So in all likelihood, the true numbers are probably much higher than what we even know. Domestic abuse is a pattern of behaviors and actions used to gain and maintain power and control over another person. That abuse can happen regardless of a person's age, race, gender identity or sexual orientation, education or income level. And it can happen within all types of intimate relationships, including romantic and familial. This is a tool that we use called the power and control wheel and it's really helpful for us in the work that we do for a couple of different reasons. First, there is a common misperception that abuse can only be physical. However, a relationship can be abusive without having any sort of physical violence happening. So this wheel does a really great job of showing that, yes, physical and sexual violence can be part of an abusive relationship, but they don't have to be. So you see physical and sexual violence represented in the outside circle, and everything else inside the wheel are non-physical ways that abuse can show up in relationships. Often, these are more subtle and more manipulative. They're harder to outright identify. Things like manipulation, coercion, intimidation can be really hard to spot when you're in the midst of it. So this wheel can often be a really empowering way for someone to identify that what they're experiencing in their relationship is in fact abuse. As we saw with the power and control wheel, there are many ways that abuse can happen in relationships. And more often than not, there are multiple types of abuse happening all at once. I'm going to call attention to some of the most common red flags we see, and then speak more specifically to what one might see in the workplace. Isolation from friends and family might include emotional or social isolation from someone's support system, as that will make it more difficult to leave an abusive relationship. But this could also include physical isolation if the person lives in a rural area, if they have uh, only one vehicle and the partner controls access to that, etc. Put downs and name calling, including verbal abuse that degrades or wears down that person's sense of self-worth and self-esteem, threatening suicide and self-harm, and using that as a means of control and manipulation can make a victim feel fearful or guilty. Nothing is ever an abuser's fault, and the victim may believe that their partner has no control over their actions, or the abuser may tell the victim that they are the cause of the abuse. Threats of outing or using blackmail to control the victim's behavior. Particularly, we see this within the immigrant or LGBTQIA communities, saying things like, well, if you leave, I'll call immigration, 
or perhaps the person's family or friends don't know about their uh, gender identity or sexual orientation and saying, well, if you leave, I'm going to tell them that we're in a relationship. Stalking can occur during a relationship or if the person has tried to leave the relationship. With someone monitoring their whereabouts, um, keeping tabs on them, and I'm going to talk more about what that might look like in the workplace a little bit later. These last three, no respect for privacy, constant messaging and checkups, and extreme jealousy, we often see with the use of technology. One partner may demand access to the other's phone or limit access to a phone. They may read messages and emails. They may call the other excessively at their workplace to make sure they're there. And jealousy can often be used as a means of justifying this behavior by saying things like, well, I just love you so much, I need to know what you're doing and who you're with, or it's for your own good. Warning signs in the workplace may show up with an employee's performance. They may have difficulty concentrating, their productivity may suffer, or they might be unable to make decisions alone. Again, if they're being controlled by a partner, their decisions are often being taken away from them which may result in them having difficulty making decisions outside of the relationship. Within your physical workspace, they may avoid windows or main entrances, particularly if they believe or know that their partner is stalking or checking in on them. They might arrive late. Again, if their partner limits access to a vehicle, that can be used as a method of control. Or they may arrive very early, as work may be the only time that they get away from their partner. Unplanned or increased use of paid time off, especially sick time, may indicate that a person has experienced an injury or something that they don't want to bring into the workplace. Flowers or gifts sent for no reason may be an apology if there was a recent explosive incident or fight or if the person has tried to end the relationship and is being stalked, that can be a way that an abuser sends a clear threat that they know where the victim is. Receiving repeated phone calls can be a way an abuser checks in and monitors their partner. It can also be a means of sabotaging their partner's job. You may also notice a person experiencing physical or somatic signs which can include bruises, which the person may try to cover, for example, by wearing long sleeves on a hot day or sunglasses inside. But there are many other ways that experiencing abuse can affect someone physically, including chronic headaches, stomach aches, and vague or nonspecific complaints of fatigue or just not feeling good. The person may experience difficulty sleeping or eating, which can also affect how they feel or function at work. Finally, they may have an intense, inexplicable startle reaction. If they are experiencing abuse at home, there is often the feeling of walking on eggshells and constantly being on edge, and this may show up in their intense reaction to anything that that was not expected. One of the most common questions that we get asked is why would someone stay in an abusive relationship? And there are many complicating factors that can make it difficult for those in abusive relationships to leave. Think about it for a second. These people are in a relationship for a reason. It likely didn't start off being abusive and things might not always be bad. Many of us try to see the best in people, especially those that we love, and hope for them to change. Statistically, we also know that the most dangerous time for someone in an abusive relationship is during and immediately after they leave. So the victim may know that it's simply not safe for them to leave at that point in time. They might have children together, and there can be a lot of guilt or pressure to keep a family together or for a child to live in a home with both parents. In over 90% of abusive relationships, there is over some sort of financial abuse occurring. That might look like limiting access to money or bank accounts, sabotaging someone's job so they can't make their own money, or ruining their credit, because that would make it really hard to leave and start a life on their own. 
There can be religious or cultural reasons, language barriers, threats of outing, particularly within the immigrant and LGBTQIA communities. And much like how there can be many types of abuse happening, there are often multiple overlapping barriers to leaving. And even in just asking the question, why do they stay? We're putting blame on the victim, saying, well, why did they get themselves into this situation? When we really should be asking, why does one person think it's okay to abuse another person? Beyond employers wanting their employees to be safe at home, there is a very real and significant cost to businesses whose employees experience domestic abuse. In fact, each year in the U.S., the cost of domestic abuse exceeds $5.9 billion. Just over $4 billion of that for direct medical and health care services, and nearly $2 billion for productivity losses. The Department of Labor also reports that victims of domestic violence lose nearly 8 million days of paid work per year. And because this is such a pervasive issue for so many, there's actually a calculator that can show the potential estimated loss for your company. I've inserted the link here. Luckily, there are a number of things that can be done as businesses, employers, co-workers and individuals to support those impacted by domestic abuse. As a company, consider adding a policy to your HR code, including a procedure to respond to employees who may disclose abuse. Provide training for your employees and managers on recognizing these potential red flags, how to support someone who has experienced abuse, and the resources available through your organization and the community. Finally, the Cambridge Public Health Department has produced a handbook including guidance and recommendations on responding to employees facing domestic abuse. So again, the WCA's vision is to foster a community where everyone thrives in safe, healthy relationships, and we believe that everyone plays a part in making this vision a reality for our community. One of the most important things that you can do is educate yourself. And this presentation is a great place to start. And now that you have this information, use it to start conversations with your employees, coworkers, and those close to you. Support and believe survivors. Provide them with any resources or information that you can. Model healthy relationships for those around you, including your children and family. And finally, carry a shoe card and make sure they're available in your workplace because you never know when somebody is going to need that lifeline. The WCA offers a number of services confidentially and at no cost to members of our community. We operate two 24-hour hotlines, which are available seven days a week, 365 days a year. These hotlines are, are for people who have experienced abuse and need help, but they're also for members of our community who may be concerned about someone and not sure what to do for them. The hotlines are answered by trained advocates that can help identify the different ways to support someone or connect them to resources. We have an emergency safe shelter. However, it is always full and there is always a waiting list. We offer safety planning for our clients to help keep them safe if they are leaving a relationship, which again is the most dangerous time for someone. Or if they are remaining in the relationship, safety planning can include things like, if you know a fight is coming and going to get physical, getting out of the kitchen and the bathrooms because those are the places with the most hard surfaces and potential weapons. A safety plan may also include talking with your employer about ways to stay safe at work. We offer court advocacy to assist and support someone seeking an order of protection. Counseling is available for youth and adults, and we even have specially trained child play therapists to work with young children who may not have the words to talk about what they have experienced. We offer two weekly support groups, 
one for survivors of sexual assault, the other for survivors of domestic abuse, and we provide case management, financial empowerment, and life skills classes to give our clients as many tools and skills as possible. Again, all of our services are available for free, and all with just a couple of exceptions are provided to men and people of all genders. I appreciate you taking the time today to listen to this presentation and learn more about the WCA, our work in the community, and ways that you can support those impacted by abuse in your workplace. Businesses and employers play a critical role in helping those in need find safety, healing, and freedom from abuse and assault. Remember, when a victim of domestic violence leaves their abuser, where is the one place the abuser knows the victim will be every day? At work. If you have any questions or would like more information about the WCA or anything we covered in this presentation, I encourage you to reach out to us. Thank you again for your time, and I hope you have a great day.